would you know history if you were standing in the middle of it? From EE Tech Media, this is Moore's Lobby, where engineers gather to talk all about circuits. I'm Dave Finch. Today in the lobby, I'm joined by Josh Giegel, co-founder and chief technology officer at Virgin Hyperloop, to talk about his company's pioneering work in magnetic levitation travel. Thirty minutes north of Las Vegas, propped sturdily above the Nevada desert, sits a tube. Inside the tube, a little pod that travels by magnetic levitation. And inside the pod? Dreams, promises, the future. It might sound like I've ingested an obscene amount of shrooms, but I assure you this is all real. Back in November, two employees from Virgin Hyperloop historically demonstrated a revolutionary new form of transportation. The trial run spanned a length of 500 meters and was completed in just 15 seconds. Virgin Hyperloop co-founder and chief technology officer Josh Giegel, joined by Sarah Lucian, the company's director of passenger experience, were the first two people to enjoy a ride in Virgin's latest innovation. It's a dream that Josh has held since 2014 when he co-founded the company. Since then, his team have made incredibly fast work of proving the safety and performance of magnetic levitation. And at age 36, Josh's view from inside the pod is a landscape of promises for sustainable transportation. Josh joins me now from California. Welcome, Josh. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I won't be able to think about any of them until I ask you, like, dude, what... <laughs> What was it like? I, I want to. I don't want to know what it was like to ride the Hyperloop. I want to know everything about what it was like. I want to know what it was like to sit down in it. Were your hands sweaty? Were you thinking, "I hope I hired the right guys and women"? Did like what did it feel like accelerating? What did it feel like cruising? Um, I, this is what I wanted to know about the Concorde when plane makers yeah. reinvented flight with the Concorde. I wanted to know that experience. Um, walk me through that. So I think the the first part, even before the, the physical, was the the mental, mm. and this thought of you know shortly after I started the company, it was like, how do you or what is it going to feel like to sit inside? And that was in November of 2014 that the company was started, and so we were sitting in that idea six years later, you know, with all the ups and downs, all the technology development to do that. And so for a decent part of the build up to it, there was a bit of a surreal feeling of, wow, this is actually happening. Yeah. What we did is create an environment inside this tube that it would be like to fly at about 200,000 feet of altitude. So mm. like 0.1% of an atmosphere. So there's not a very large amount of air there. And typically the only people that have gone through that wear spacesuits. Right. It's extraterrestrial. Yeah, exactly. And so here we are with the extraterrestrial environment here on Earth. And the two people getting in this pod are not wearing spacesuits. <laughs> they are not trained astronauts. They are not any of these things. You're used to breathing air just like with your face. Yeah. And so actually one of the, uh, you know, I was talking with the Secretary of Transportation and, and she was talking about names like, well, you call you know, Argonauts, you've got astronauts, you've got all of these different things. Are you hypernauts? And part of me likes the idea of the word hypernaut. That sounds pretty badass. It does sound pretty badass. But the other part is sort of like, actually, we were just people. Mm. And so we had like a training week and we went through a scenarios with emergency response crews. You know, we all the things that we're going to have to do for a production vehicle except I got to experience it completely different. So, you know, being the CTO, all of the engineering reports up through me and I'm used to being the general, yeah. right? So how often does the general <laughs> go stand on the front lines and go experience what it'd be like to, to do this? And so there's, yeah. there's an excitement from that, right? There's this idea of like this beautiful metaphor 
for belief in one's team, which mm -hmm. is like the Roman architect, right? The Roman architect would have to stand under his arch when he pulled the scaffolding away as his measure of worth. Mm -hmm. And so in that same way, you talk about leaders, you know, saying if they succeed, it's because of the team. If they fail, it's because of me as the leader. And you think what better way to, to demonstrate that, to show faith in your team or to show the ultimate accepting of, of accountability if something goes wrong than to put yourself in that situation. And, and you get there and you realize all of a sudden this group of people are actually your colleagues and the people that have got you to the place where you can get in this vehicle and you can be safe. Uh, it, it was like just pretty emotional. It's pretty, pretty overwhelming. And uh, it was actually pretty funny. Growing up, I always wanted to be an astronaut. Okay. Uh, so it was always something that was kind of this, this dream of, of doing something first. This was so much more than that because it was like part of an idea, part of a company that you started. And, and so my wife knows me and we've, we've been together for a long time. And when we started the company, I asked her, I said, so give me a, give me a list of the people that, you know, you think are smart enough to work here, but also can, can deal with me. She came back with a list of one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wait, so uh, does she know smart people? Yeah, uh, she does know plenty of smart people, but I think that the, mm. the, the think the bigger disqualifier was could work with me. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. as someone who's uh, married to me, I think she knew that that was a pretty pretty <laughs> tough bar. <laughs> Are you hard to live with? Like in your like, what what makes you difficult to be around? Um, I can be a perfectionist, and I can be very demanding of quality demanding of yourself is a perfectionist and you have the same expectation yeah. of your contributors so highly highly self-critical um but also someone who can see mistakes like pretty quickly and mm -hmm. absolutely hates mistakes so it's and it's different being a dad now you know i've got a son who's like two where it's like, hey, if he's playing somewhere, I'm, I don't, I let him play. If he, if he falls down, he falls down, he learns. If he, you know, obviously I don't like let him go do something that could seriously injure himself, but right, it's also right. like he needs to, to explore. And part of what we do is exploring as well. We have to try things and we have to fail and you have to do some things. But there's times when you can see a failure coming or a mistake happening. And do you shepherd them away from it? knowing that the next time you might have to shepherd them away from it again, or do you let them make the mistake, which impacts the overall company, but I can guarantee you these guys are good enough that they don't make that mistake again. So it's kind of about that. It's also about like really being really detailed and really being thorough because I ask very difficult technical questions and if people who are supposed to be the <clears throat> subject matter experts you know, don't have all the answers, it's kind of like, well, why don't you have all the answers? Because there's nobody else at the company who would have them but you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And as a perfectionist, some people go, it can break one of two ways. One is that perfection becomes paralyzing and it you stagnate because you beat yourself up. You wallow in, oh, I made a mistake. I'm the worst. I'm not good enough at this. And then they just like walk away. Yep. You seem to have an ability to learn from the mistake glean the lesson and learn forward so you don't repeat the mistake you expect that of others around you but you don't it doesn't sound like you beat yourself up too long anyway maybe you beat yourself up for an hour <laughs> too too long is the right is the right piece and i think it it varies from time to time which is like how long are you going to live in that mistake right and then that's kind of proportional to to the to the volume of beat up that i give myself Okay, so so your wife goes into her uh, mental Rolodex and offers up only one person who would be a good match for you. So the uh, the guy that she gave me is a guy named Brian Galmer, and Brian was like employee number four here. Mm -hmm. He's our VP of test and development, and so the night before the test, um, her and my son came out to uh, to Las Vegas to the test site, and she said, "I'm going to go have drinks with Brian." And I was like, "Okay." Mm. And so they go out to have drinks. I'm getting texts from Brian. She goes, your wife's asking me how safe this test is. Uh. <laughs> she says, because she doesn't want to ask you because you're going to tell her it's going to be perfectly, you know, perfectly fine. And so, uh, but so that was even before it went down the track. Yeah. 
But once you get into there, once it started going, it, you know, pushed you back in your seat a little bit, mm. accelerated like 0.75 Gs, was about three times harder than a an aircraft uh, acceleration, which isn't what we do for normal, but it was for this test. And- so you're sitting in your seat yeah. and what you're experiencing at half a G is a th- about three times the thrust that you would feel on a commercial, say, 737 as it's taking off. Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. So cool. So it's just this... Uh, it's almost like being in a uh, like a supercar with somebody who knows how to drive it. Just an unexpected, yeah. like holy. Yeah, yeah. And so it pushes you back in your seat. And um, there's once you started to get going, it was it was it was kind of hard to process. It was very smooth, even though what was kind of surreal is my my co passenger Sara, who leads our passenger experience team. The way I describe her is a bit of a, a stoic type of of woman, and. I don't know, we were about three or four seconds on the tube. And if you watch the video, she started like whooping. <laughs> I remember like looking over in the middle of this completely amazing, completely historic test. I remember looking over and saying, wow, it's surprising that Sara whoops. Like, <laughs> I wouldn't have put, I wouldn't have put her down as a whooper, you know? <laughs> I love that. Um, well, but that's such a human, you're dealing with superhuman technology and like the, she's whooping the same way as my kids when I used to toss them in the air and then catch them. It's just this <laughs> thrill, right? Like this, what is happening kind of thrill. I can imagine that would be a really delightful moment inside of that pod. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, when it came down to a stop and even in the buildup, you know, I was excited was the wrong word. I was giddy. <laughs> there was a, a brief moment of like emotional release where you realize like, wow, we just set out to do something really hard. We achieved it. You saw the team like rallying around it. It kind of still hasn't hit me just yet because the response from potential people who want a Hyperloop, who want to who want to actually ride in a Hyperloop, the whole thing has just been like completely time consuming. But when you mm. look back, you know, one of the phrases I also use with my team is like, would you know history if you were standing in the middle of it? Oh, man. And this was a moment where like for the rest of your life, you can say you do. And I've been really fortunate. You know, I've had a really, you know, unique career where I've got to do lots of firsts for things. And I probably have definitely more than my fair share in in about 12 years of experience. But these are these moments, like you look back and you say, what did you, you know, I have a two-year-old now and said, what do you do, dad? Like what? what did you do on this earth? And you're like, let me tell you about something I did on this earth. Mm. And, uh, and let me tell you about something the team did on this earth. And that's something that I think is really, it's exciting on so many levels. And, you know, you, you don't get numb to it. You just be become accustomed to like, we're going to do really hard things. We're going to do them really well. And uh, I hope, I hope I never get numb to the joy of success, but I hope, I enjoy the pursuit of it in a way that continues to make me want to do it again. Hey, everybody, it's Dave. This portion of Moore's Lobby is sponsored by Future Electronics. Headquartered in Montreal and operating in 169 locations in 44 countries around the world, Future Electronics has earned an impressive reputation for providing outstanding service and developing efficient, comprehensive global supply chain solutions. The company's success is built largely upon its commitment to maintain close business partnerships with suppliers and customers, coupled with the strength of its commercial and technical competencies through all stages of the design to production cycle. For more info, please go to futureelectronics.com. All right, we're back with Josh Giegel, co-founder and CTO of Virgin Hyperloop. My ambitions are telling jokes. <laughs> and I don't I don't need a team to to be a smart ass. Your ambitions. Let's unpack this a little bit because uh you you alluded to this earlier when you said, you know, the ultimate accountability is you, but also at the same time if there's success here, it's the team, which a good leader recognizes that, but a good employee recognizes that they're all there because of the leader, right? So let's step into that from a little bit longer of a runway. You have, you're extremely young. Um, 
how old are you? Uh, I just turned 36. Okay. <laughs> so, so you, you started, you got your master's degree in mechanical engineering, right? And, and undergraduate, obviously. Um, yeah. This positioned you nicely for a career in aerospace and your work in aerospace with propulsion systems. Somehow, by the age of 32... Or no, uh, by the age of 30, geez, Louise, you had parlayed what you were doing uh, in propulsion systems into, I'm, I'm going to go start my own company and I'm going to transform how humans um, traverse not only Earth, but uh, we're going to take this into space and we're going to use what we learn here to transform how we, uh, how we move about. I'm going to basically invent new mobility for mankind what was your mindset like how does how does a 28 year old look ahead a couple of years and say i'm gonna get myself i'm gonna start a company like what what are how are you operating at that level that's insane to me it was uh that's, that's a good good question i was working i was doing my graduate school and at that time what i was looking at was kind of staying on for PhD phd or going to SpaceX. Um, and this mm -hmm. was like 2008 or so. And I went on a couple interviews. I was getting ready to do some stuff for, you know, for the PhD. And I happened to go on an interview to SpaceX. And I was turned on to SpaceX by a colleague. I had, when I interned at NASA a couple years earlier, where I actually met my wife, I had met this, this woman who'd been at NASA for a while. And she said, you don't want to come to NASA. You're going to be bored here. You should mm -hmm. check out this company called SpaceX. Um, so once I was like, well, I was going to do grad school, but then I decided let's go check it out. And I remember coming, interviewing at SpaceX right before they had their first successful flight, flight four of the baby rocket in 2008. When I interviewed and I came back, I remember telling my thesis advisor, I said, there's nothing I'd rather do less on this planet than what you just described. <laughs> <laughs> and so you go to SpaceX and it was just this chance to be you know, almost like completely overwhelmed. You were, you know, I was 23 at the time and mm -hmm. like, here's way too much responsibility. Don't mess it up. Right. And it was, it was good. And you just, you started to go, you started to understand like the opportunity when you're unconstrained and you can just build test and, and, and go. And then, then what I started to see is, you know, when I started SpaceX, there's about 500 people. Um, when I left, there was about 2,500 people. And I really wanted to go something smaller. I've kind of had all this, this romanticism about starting a company someday. And I went from SpaceX to a company that had about 50 people. It was smaller. I got to take on more of a role, more authority, more decision-making, more influence of research and development. And then the opportunity really is like, okay, now, you know, a couple of guys I worked with at, at SpaceX and a venture capitalist approached me in like middle of 2014 and talked about, about starting this. And at first I was like, mm, I don't know, let me think about it a little bit. And I start, I went home and I started doing some research, like how big is transportation? And, and then it's, then it kind of dawned on me, wow, this is a once in like a multi-generational type of project. A, mm -hmm. no one's done anything like it before. No one, no one knows what a Hyperloop looks like. So we had the chance to create that. B, it's a sustainable story. It's making sure that, you know, the role, the job of the engineer is to let people live the way they want to live without destroying the world around us. Mm -hmm. And for, for the transportation space, like we can build that system here. And then thirdly, this is going to be around long after I'm gone. Yep. So you get to work on something new, something hard, something that's environmentally sustainable and responsible and it's a legacy project i don't really know what else there is to to sign up for like if that doesn't yeah. get you out of bed in the morning then like you better check your pulse <laughs> absolutely and especially somebody like you who is clearly not only are you not at least on the surface you don't appear to be afraid of the enormity of responsibility like you'll step up to that and you'll elevate your game to it instead of shying away from it Exactly. And, and I think there's, there's also a little bit of, I want to say it's a little bit of cockiness, it's a little bit of arrogance, and maybe it's a little bit of naivete of youth, you know, to your point, which is like, yeah, I think I could do this, right? Mm -hmm. if, if I knew then what I know now, doesn't mean I wouldn't do it. It's just like, 
hey, this is going to be harder than you think it is. And <laughs> right. right. But uh, again, like so many people are faced with that and they don't even realize they're standing in their own history when they make a decision to shy away and say, I'm just not ready for it. Yeah. Like you said, once in many generations do you get the opportunity to make that much of a difference and being at the helm of it. I mean, it's got to be exciting for the people on your team, but you coached the team down the field, got them into that end zone and won the game. Yeah. And uh, I think coaching definitely has its its ups and its downs. But the mm. the part that I've I've really taken away profoundly is that that sense of like what the team has been able to accomplish. And and again, I've been super fortunate in my career to have, have experienced teams like this multiple times. And having the opportunity to do that before at SpaceX and then having a chance to build a team like that and continue to be impressed by what they're able to accomplish makes the victory even even sweeter when you're there. It's like, wow, these guys did something amazing and they did it really tough and they, they did it well. And um, it actually, it's the thing that sticks after the celebration is gone is like, when you're looking at that same person six months from now, knowing that you were in a foxhole together, you know, not all that long ago, trying to get this thing accomplished, they'd like, wow, you can really trust this team. Hey, everybody, Dave again. Wanted to talk a little bit more about Future Electronics. Future is globally integrated, supported by one IT infrastructure which provides real-time inventory availability and access, while enabling full integration of operations, sales, and marketing worldwide. Future Electronics boasts the most knowledgeable sales team and provides the most advanced engineering and design capabilities and technical solutions, award-winning customer service, best-in-class global trade compliance program, and the largest available-to-sell inventory in the world. For more info, please go to futureelectronics.com. Dot com. We're back with Josh Giegel, co-founder and CTO of Virgin Hyperloop. What we're essentially talking about with a Hyperloop is a way to harness the benefits of magnetic levitation and principles of propulsion to uh, reimagine transportation and sustainable transportation. So how do you define what a hyperloop is today versus how you would have defined what a hyperloop is in 2014 November when you started the company? That's a good one. Uh, they're not they're not overly different, mm. except it's a bit more succinct now and also a little bit more specific, right? So hyperloop is a new form of transportation. It's on demand, 100% electric, mm. direct to your destination. It's not stopping at every place along the way. Yeah. And it's moving at the speed of an, an aircraft for about 10 times less energy consumption. Amazing. 10 times less energy consumption, moving the same amount of people at the same rate. Ah, oh, jeez. I just okay. So, how do you begin to? Is this is this a feat of mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, or both? It's both. It's like building the airport, the airplane, the air traffic control, and the sky at the same time. And it's <laughs> it, now. Now it sounds like a lot because it is right. a lot, and yeah. it could be paralyzing in terms of you know infinite you know. Uh, no constraints is an infinite freedom, right? It's, it's paralysis. But at the same time, if you got to simultaneously optimize all four of those things, you could build something truly revolutionary. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really what we have here is like, all right, all of those things about the journey, whatever your mode of transportation that you don't like, you don't have to recreate them. Oh, you don't like having to taxi around an airport. You don't like having to be waiting around weather. Oh, you don't like having to stop at every single destination or every single stop along a train. Like, then don't do it. Mm -hmm. Don't design the experience. You know, don't design in the things you hate into kind of the experience of the future. And so for us, it's really this, this freedom to optimize all of them 
There are some mechanical aspects of it, but there's a lot of electrical and electromechanical aspects of it. So, Mm -hmm. and those things are the pretty phenomenal type of technologies. And now I will say we're not building a hyperloop per se. We're building a long range, high power, um, autonomous electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. It happens to be a hyperloop in the first instance, but can also be a number of other things. So it's it's a feat as much of you know mechanical, but it's even more of a feat of really the electrical, the electromagnetics, the power electronics, and then the controls. Um, so yeah. the reason I say it, it's like our vehicle is like a solid state vehicle. There's almost no moving parts. Ex- basically, the doors are the only moving parts. Amazing. How strong are these magnetic fields relative to you know an MRI machine, or is it closer to a one horsepower DC motor? Like what? What are we trying to drive here? So we're a lot closer to a one horsepower DC motor. So No kidding. Yeah. So usually MRI machines, I think, are somewhere between like three and five Tesla field strengths, which are pretty strong. And that's what one of the original maglevs, the Japanese one, Shinkansen, is actually using. They're actually using superconducting coils to get these really strong fields. A lot of that is design legacy because they built that system in the 60s and 70s when they didn't have these rare earth magnets that were as strong as they are today. So they had power electronics to, you know, yeah, exactly. And so, so the magnetic fields are, you know, I we're around them all the time. They're not much different than some of the stuff in your phone or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Like you get a tool stuck to it that are hard to get off, but there's nothing that actually, you know, affects you in a detrimental way. And from the the power electronics side, basically manipulate electromagnets to control the entire vehicle. So in a way, it almost looks like the the Nebuchadnezzar from the Matrix, right? (laughs) Where you see these different kind of magnetic levitations going on without all the arcing and all that other fun stuff. But yeah, yeah. And we are right at some of the cutting edge of what it's like to control these vehicles and in 10 or 20 years, it's going to open up a different class of vehicles because sure. now we have to do something that's, you know, an electric car can always pull over. We can't pull over. So we have to have the same type of safety that an aircraft does, but in an electric vehicle. So what does that mean from battery fires? What does that mean from a whole bunch of other things? And we're going to be an are at kind of the forefront of that for the next type of electric transportation, which is not just cars and buses, but aircraft, big aircraft, um, small personal transport and things like that, that are just going to slowly transform the way that we all live and work. And these are real, like in front of us problems, these problems you solve for one area, you're solving for many areas. And that's things like, how do we ensure very safe battery management and power distribution so that we're not, you know, bursting into flames or, you know, how can we guarantee that, uh, with, with redundancy, say that um, the right combination of H bridge drivers are not going to go out at this at like mile marker thirty in the hyperloop, right? Like, I really, I really appreciate that. I finally had an interview that talked about H bridge drivers. So, like, <laughs> kudos, Dave. Like, I've done so many interviews, but no one's ever gone that direction. So, I'm really like stoked that you went this way. I like it. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, this goes back to my earlier question. This is why I'm hard to live with because when we go to parties, <laughs> my wife is going to be like, don't bring up motor drivers. Like I have to, <laughs> but, but that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at is, um, like even an electric vehicle, once it reaches, you know, once it's driving, you're on a road and, uh, the people who invented the electric vehicle are not accountable for the road you are. Um, yeah. So you had to reinvent the quote unquote road or the rail or the airspace. So were these electronics developed in house or did you have uh, electronics partners at Virgin? So we, we have mainly developed in house. There are some, you know, chips, you know, high powered chipsets that we use that are kind of commercial off the shelf Okay, um, that we basically put into our circuits design. So the same way you might grab like an Intel chip or, you know, a power MOSFET or an IGBT to put into your, you know, your machine designs, we buy those individual kind of modules and then design the whole system around it. Are you at liberty to say, are these IGBTs, are they like silicon carbide MOSFETs uh, doing the switching? 
So we've moved over to the silicon carbide MOSFETs. They're nice. so much more power efficient. Yeah. And they are so much more thermally efficient. They're smaller. They're like, aside from being a little bit more expensive, they're better in every category. <laughs> Slightly more expensive for their unit cost, but if you look at the entire bill of materials, exactly, you can reduce the amount of copper, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and they pay for themselves pretty pretty quick. But like that, you know, even some of the modules that we're using these days, you know, they were f- fresh off the assembly line a year ago, mm-hmm. and you know, state of the art at that point, and they're continuing to get better. And but like. Even three or four years ago, the the machine that we're building now, the pod that we're building now, wouldn't have been possible. And that's the part that's really exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, how how are you manipulating? What what are the de- uh, design requirements for that magnetic field itself? Does it need to rotate? Is it is it like static? Yeah. So so without getting into the details of ours, I can give you kind of the generic piece, which is yeah, we have to. So we have to build a linear machine. So something that works in a straight line. So imagine unwinding that, that rotary machine, Mm -hmm. but you need to have, it needs to be very uh, electrically efficient because, you know, if you're powering the vehicle with, with the battery, like you don't want to have too big a battery. Yep. It needs to be very thermally efficient because we don't have any air in the tube to convect to. Yeah. It's like, Okay. And then, <laughs> then it also ne- needs to have a really high power factor so that you don't have really big cables. Right. <laughs> right. Because, you know, these things aren't going 30 feet. They're going, you know, <laughs> cross country. Yeah. Um, were there any big surprise takeaways for you in terms of the either the electronics design or the electromechanical stuff or system wide? Uh, there's a couple of key key fundamental beliefs or philosophy design philosophies that I subscribe to. Um, first one is modularity. Mm. And this is the ability to have, uh, multiple units of things that are for lack of a better word, kind of plug and play. And you can move these in and out and the things inside of these boxes can change. And that gets to the next, but next piece, which is upgradability. And so if things inside the box change, but I can still plug that box in, I actually have something that's uniquely capable of absorbing the future of technology. Because compared to conventional like maglev, where on day one, they have to build everything out. So in 30 or 40 years, they can't take advantage of the technology that evolves. And so for us, by making the the tube dumb and the vehicle really smart, you know, for me, it was actually pretty profound uh, about almost four years ago. Now I was riding my bike in uh, Santa Monica's and I was riding up in a model T, sorry, a model, (laughs) um, a a Ford Roadster, 33 Roadster came, came down the hill. (laughs) And I remember thinking at that time, like, isn't it crazy that that car is almost a hundred years old and it can drive on the same road? Yes. <laughs> right. And that kind of started this transformative process of like, okay, so it should be modular. It should be up- upgradable because those two things allow it to be future proof. Yes. Which is I can, I, I'm not scared of future technology. I'm actually incentivized for it because right now, like my biggest costs are energy costs and battery replacement costs. And guess what? QuantumScape just told us that there's a solid state battery three years ahead of when I thought there would be. And so now I can take advantage of that. Because the one thing, like I love the Wright brothers, but the one thing um, that I was actually really disappointed with is that they were the first, but there's a reason you and I don't ride on Wright brothers airlines is because they stopped innovating and they Mm. just tried to protect and sue and the dark side is like all of the legal filings that they had to try to protect their patents on kind of the airplane and then the world passed them by yep it designed around them yeah and so for us it's like i'm doing this because i like that and i see the future but i also know that there's going to be things i can't yet conceive of there's going to be technology improvements i can't yet conceive of and i want a system that can absorb all those because otherwise i'm going to be irrelevant so Short of t- 
teleportation, <laughs> I think we'll be, I think we'll be all right. You know, I'll be able to take advantages of all the, the way that huge amount of investment is going into the electric vehicle industry. And my system just keeps getting better. And the even more beautiful part of this is right now I'm a bit range limited. So like my first product, you know, within the next four or five years has somewhere between about five and 600 kilometers of range by 2030, that same product has 800, 900, 1,000 kilometers of range. I can't, I'm I'm not going to build a 1,000 kilometer route before I build a 400 kilometer route. And so it's almost like naturally, like the system just keeps getting better and better as I need the system to keep getting better and better and better without me really having to do all that much aside from a couple guys make some battery improvements, a couple guys make some other, you know, slight improvements in their system. And I just take more and more and more advantage of it. This segment of Moore's Lobby is brought to you by Rody and Schwartz. Rody and Schwartz is one of the world's leading manufacturers of test and measurement, secure communications, monitoring and network testing, and broadcasting equipment. Founded more than 80 years ago, this independent company has an extensive sales and service network with subsidiaries and representatives in more than 70 countries. Incorporated in the United States since 1978, Rody and Schwartz USA Inc has a large team of sales and application engineers throughout North America with regional offices in Maryland, Texas, California, and Oregon. They have a world-class service facility in Columbia, Maryland, and their customers can expect extensive after-sales support, including training, free technical support, and close personal contact from their engineers out in the field. For more info, go to rody-schwarz.com. We're back for our final segment with Josh Giegel, co-founder and CTO of Virgin Hyperloop. You described that moment where the night before you're about to buckle yourself into what is essentially the culmination of your six years of work uh, up to that point. um, Your wife says, I need somebody who will tell me honestly. So she goes and (laughs) and you're in Las Vegas, which is a town notorious for gamble and odds and risk and, um, you know, not too many people leave Las Vegas ahead. <laughs> so yeah. uh, I, I kind of like that backdrop as well. What strikes me about your wife even being able to sleep the night before is that you are the Roman architect and you're standing under your arch. What's fascinating to me, too, is the wife and the child of the Roman architect who are like, really, there's nobody else in the company who can pay your bill if this goes <laughs> wrong. Um, did she have faith as an engineer? Did she have serious concerns as a wife? And how did you two reconcile that? It's, it's a masterful question. I think the, put it this way, like I like doing adventurous things, but I mm-hmm. don't have a death wish. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that she knows that, um, but she also knows how much I've put into this, this company and the like. And one of the things that was really important about this process. So we as a company and myself in particular, we had limited experience in a company with actually building what I'd call man rated vehicles. So something that could be safe enough for a passenger to go in. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that was really important is I'm, I'm on the board and I'm voting on whether or not we should actually put a person in this test or not. Mm -hmm. And for me, just the way I operate for me to accurately do that, it's like, I need to assume that I'm going to be that person because if it's not safe enough for me, how could I vote on somebody else taking that risk? Exactly. And in that, in that view of, okay, like I'm going to submit myself to the process in which we've created Yes. And then I'm going to see if if I come out the other side and still feel comfortable going on because I want to know what risks we're asking others to take because I think that that better puts in perspective what I'm trying to do as as a company. Like if you got to live, you got to live through the risk to understand ultimately what you're trying to achieve in a way. And she's been as much a part of the success of Hyperloop as I have been. 
even though sure. she's never worked a day at Hyperloop, is that you start to realize that the level of consuming that this is from a time point of view, but also from a mental capacity point of view, lots of times comes comes at her expense. And actually, a week ago, I was watching a documentary on Neil Armstrong. Mm. And Neil Armstrong's wife, when he walked on the moon, was, was Janet. And they eventually got divorced. And she was saying why they got divorced. And she, she said, he had a lot of priorities, and I wasn't one of them. Mm -hmm. And I can think about like conversations I've had with my wife, where at times, that's been she could say the exact same thing. It's like, there's been lots of priorities, like the kid, the company, travel for this or this. And like a lot of times she ends up taking a back seat, undeservedly so, mm -hmm. but supportive nonetheless. And and so in a way, like she understood the risks. We never really talked about the explicit risks in like a probabilistic way, like I did with my team. Right. But we talked about it in the more abstract sense of like. Is this, you know, Lucas, who's our son's like, Lucas needs a dad. And, mm -hmm. you know, I need a husband and I need all these other things. And I said, Steph, like, this is, this is not that level of risk. If we didn't do all of these things, it, it could have very well been that level of risk. But like, here's what happens if this happens. Here's what happens if that happens. And so the test that you saw was really only about a quarter of the capability of that system. And all the things that went into contingencies if something happened that we tested, those were the real, the real pieces. And in a way, like you kind of view the test that we did as running a marathon. It's the actual, it's all the runs that you do before you get to race day that actually gets you able to do it in the first place. Mm. And that's really what what happened for us is it was the act of getting ready for the race, getting ready to do that test that actually showed we could do the test at all. Yes. And the test, like we didn't even have to do the test to still have gotten everything out of it. Now, that being said, something of that magnitude focuses people's energy. It focuses the mind. It focuses effort. And I think that saying we are going to actually put a person in it, going through all the motions and then doing it actually really really came to pass. And, and I think that with, with her in particular, she knew this is something, you know, that was really meaningful to me. She also, she also knew she's like, there's nobody else that should be the first person. Mm -hmm. So at the same yeah. time, it couldn't, it, I wasn't allowed to be me, but it also couldn't be anybody else. So it was kind of a dilemma. Right? Uh, marriages are tricky, but yours a little bit uniquely. So <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the, this this short is that we're living in a pretty incredible time. We built a really incredible company here to to really get people excited. And there was kind of a surreal moment. The I had the Secretary of Transportation from the United States on a broadcast saying that Hyperloop was officially being recognized as a mode of transportation. Mm. You think about that for a moment. I was actually out getting ready to do some of this, this testing that for the vehicle and thinking like, what a movement this has become. Yeah. You know, we sat in a garage. We, I sat in investor rooms, you know, being like, Hey, you could go do anything you want. Why are you doing this? This is crazy. And here we are, we're on the cusp of people really believing that this could be the future. And I took my first ride a little over a month ago and the most important thing of that was seeing two people get on, but actually seeing two people get off. <laughs> that's more important and than getting on. That's yes. more important than getting on. And, and this is that, that moment where it's like, you can drive out and if you ever get a chance. Anybody happens to be in Vegas, get on the 15, drive 30 minutes North. You'll get to a road on the 93. And if you look off to, to the West, there's a tube sitting in the desert. That was that, and that tube will be in the desert for a very long time. <laughs> and that tube was built by a group of people who yeah. put it there because they could. And that to me is the most exciting thing is that like, this is, this was nothing more than an idea that I was sitting in a month ago. And it's, uh, it's awesome. <laughs> Thank you.
I want to thank Josh Giegel for making time to chat with me today. Be sure to subscribe to Moore's Lobby on any of the major podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, to enjoy new episodes every two weeks with industry experts from world-renowned companies who join us to chat about leading-edge technology and engineering topics. You can also follow us and catch prior episodes on allaboutcircuits.com. Thanks for listening.